I'd just like to introduce you first. Thank you. <laughs> Sue, who is an um, absolutely cool member of our team and um, has done, she's now actually a film star, aren't you, Sue? Not quite, but. <laughs> um, and is a coalition, co production member for a coalition for collaborative care. And Catherine's here as well today. And without Sue, uh, we would not be able to get our message off across in quite such an articulate uh, and meaningful way. So Thank Sue's you. just going to start, and then I'll, I'll carry on after Sue. Speak it there, is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for, for inviting me here today. As Penny said, my name is Sue Denmark, and I'm a member of the co-production group of the Coalition for Collaborative Care. For those of you who don't know uh, much about the coalition, um, please look it up. But our, th our three uh, main aims are community, co-production, and conversation. So it fits in very well with what uh, we're going to talk about today. I'm also a person with lived experience. I have MS and arthritis. And uh, my background, my background is in social work. Um, I'm no longer actively involved day to day, but still keep in touch with, with lots of um, activities that are going on in social care. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself later on, but first of all, I wanted to start by talking about my mum. My mum uh, died a few years ago, um, but her history and her, her story was of, of one of uh, great sort of courage and resilience. So she was married to my dad, who took on a small business, electrical business. He was an electrician. And shortly after the, he, he did that, he died very suddenly um, of cancer. My mum, who was very much a stay-at-home mum, loved cooking um, and looking after the home, suddenly was thrust into having to keep uh, the business going in order to keep us going. We lived above the shop. She was an amazing woman. She got used to hiring and firing people, buying stuff, sorting out the finances, paying a mortgage for 25 years. Credible woman. And uh, often she had to go into hospital for various things. And later in life, she developed Parkinson's, diabetes, and for the last six years had a, uh, the effects of a stroke. One of the things that I always remember about my mum was when she was in hospital, a very uh, a kind but slightly patronising OT decided it was time she practised writing in order to keep her writing a good size because of the Parkinson's. So they made my mum sign her name several times, which my mum did really easily with a flourish. And the OT said, Gosh, have you been writing lots of birthday cards? You did that so well. And my mum said, no, I write lots of cheques. <laughs> and I think that, that bit there really shows just how sometimes we don't realise what people, skills and assets and all the things that they can do. We look at the things that they can't do. When she died, I looked through a folder. And in one year, my mum had 13 assessments. 13 assessments, but nothing actually reflected all those strengths, all those skills that she'd had and the way that she conducted her life. They weren't addressed in a health care or a social care, really. She was just seen as a patient, somebody who was needing services. So roll on until sort of 2010, and I find myself being diagnosed with a neurological condition and osteoarthritis. So it was a bit of deja vu. And sadly, still, things were still the same. Things were still the same about being assessed about what's wrong, what can't you do. And, you know, at the time I was still working as a social worker, I was still able to do lots of things, um, have lots of conversations, but I was seen as somebody who needed something. Two of the examples that I, I think sort of stuck in my mind about this just can't be the way of doing things was one when I spoke to my doctor about losing weight. It had been mentioned a few times and I decided I need to address it. And I asked her, what, what's, what's, she had any suggestions, what could I do to lose weight? And she said, eat less potatoes. Well, I don't eat many potatoes. Other things I eat, but not potatoes. And that was it. Oh, and get a smaller plate. And those were her two suggestions. Neither of them worked for me. I just went out of there feeling quite disillusioned. The other conversation I had was around diabetes. And I said that we had a family history and is there anything I could do to prevent uh, getting di uh, being diabetic? Uh, and she said, no, you'll most certainly have be diabetic. 
just learn to, to live with it and expect to, to be diabetic at some point in your life. Uh, so I went away with the feeling like I should just go and tuck into a pile of cakes, really, because if I was gonna, if I was gonna go down that road, I was gonna enjoy the journey. Um, so it was really kind of those conversations which made me think things needed to be different. I did have some positive conversations, really, really positive conversations with different people. Sometimes only very short ones, but but ones that sort of realised what my strengths were and what I could do. So one consultant who knew there was a new drug coming out said to me, go away and look at this. You know, you know the sites to go and have a look. This is the drug. They'll be, it'll be coming out within the next six months. And then we'll have a conversation about what you think about the drug and what you think about the side effects and if it will suit you. And that short conversation just felt, you know, really like I was being treated like a human being and somebody who had a bit of a brain left. So... A different way of doing things was always on my mind. And then I had the uh, privilege of having a very short 10-minute session of health coaching. Um, it was really only just to kind of like just to, to see how it went. But it really did make a difference. Really, I, for the first time, I actually began to think about what I did, how I behaved, the way I ate, the way that I, I um, conducted my life, the kind of style that I had of my life, and I came up with my own solutions. So I realised, for example, that I'm somebody who is, tends to snack more rather than eat two or three big meals a day, um, and I had to look at what I could do to do things differently. So a, a year or so on, I've not lost, I've not gone from those like Weight Watchers, you know, down from a great big weight down to sort of size zero, but I have lost over a stone. And it's a really interesting thing because I don't have to think about it anymore. But because I've come up with my own solutions, I really look right down to the very detail of what I do with my eating now. So for example, when we go on a car journey on holiday, um, one of the things that we always do is have a packet of sweets. A packet of Maltesers is the usual one. Um, this time, when I go, went on holiday, I took a, a punnet of raspberries. You know, I could have taken a bar of chocolate, but actually what I needed was to replicate the same action that you do when you eat a packet of Maltesers, you know, dip in, eat one. So it's about thinking about the kind of things that I'm, I'm doing all the time and looking for substitutions. But that was my own solution, and I don't think anybody else could have come up with that for me. Nobody knows how or what I do, you know, when I'm at home or when I'm travelling. Other things that I've done, you know, looking at increasing my steps, so I've got the Fitbit, so I now do a lot more walking. I love walking. It's always been a real passion of mine. Uh, doctors understood that I needed to walk, and they were great about getting me back to a certain level where I could bend my legs or walk so many metres. But I actually wanted to walk and walk on my own and walk with my dog. And so I was, through health coaching, I identified that joining somebody who could help give me confidence um, uh, would be great. And I joined a local group for people who uh, walk short distances with support. Now I'm so able to, do, to walk um, without support that I actually lead that group um, in, the, in the local club. So it's a really, really positive thing for me. <clears throat> So I feel like I've had really lots of uh, opportunities uh, now to start exploring my health issues. And I recognise that that's great for me, but I don't think it's, it's not enough. And it's not everywhere. And what we really need is to have that kind of health coaching approach, not just only in GP surgeries and across the whole surgery, but much wider in the community, across other health professionals, in social care, so that we get a consistent, consistent approach and be offered that opportunity to look for our own solutions. I've had some amazing care um, in the last few years, and I'm eternally grateful to those people who've looked after me. Um, and I've had some operations that have saved my life, without doubt. But most importantly, it's the conversations and not the operations which have given me back my life. They've given me a small, but can we come up with small but effective solutions that really do make my life mine again. 
I think health coaching has made me realise that, you know, in me, I have the answers and I don't have to look for other people. But what I do need is for people to ask me the right questions. And I think that's what we all need, somebody to ask us the right questions and then we can come up with our own solutions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sue. I'm moved every time you speak, actually, and um, it's amazing what a 10-minute conversation can do. With Andrew here, I think, was the first time yeah, you <laughs> had a demo um, at one of these events, so I'm so fantastic. Um, I'm Penny Newman. I'm a GP. <clears throat> I'm also trained in public health, and I think that combination is what draw, drew me to um, this event and all the work that we've been doing over the last six years and it's just a real privilege to see you all and honour to see you all today um, and I hope that we can all carry on the conversation together. I'm just going to carry on a bit more from Sue, uh, um, talking to you about some, com um, some stories from patient opinion. I'm going to talk about health coaching, what it is, the evidence and how we're you know, I hope that you will join us. You are now all part of our social movement. I, 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 um, you're all members now, so um, how we all together can carry on the conversation. So, um, Right, so Sue's told uh, you her story, and uh, when I was first uh, growing this, we're launching this as an uh, NHS Innovation Accelerator Fellow at, at the last, of, uh, last year, I asked Patient Opinion to look at some of the stories on their website. Are you all familiar with Patient Opinion? It's a fantastic innovation, um, and it, um, uh, patients give their feedback on their care to patient opinion who then feed it back to their organisation and they have a sort of whole library of patient stories. And I asked them to look at um, stories that were identified through the words listened to, involved, empowered, motivated, enabled. And they came up with 162 stories in a two year period. And they were looking at what happens when people feel listened to and involved in their care and what happens when they don't and what are the implications. So when people feel listened to, uh, this means that they're given time, they're really listened to, they're given clear, accessible information, there's a two-way communication and knowledge, their knowledge is respected as equals, they're treated holistically as a whole person, not a body part or a set of problems or a condition, but as a whole person, and as an individual with idiosyncratic needs, and they're given options and encouraged and shared decision making, and 98% of people uh, experienced that and as a result they felt empowered. They felt valued and cared for, they had enhanced confidence in their healthcare professional and the service and their own recovery, they felt more motivated to look after themselves, they felt that they were more capable of looking after themselves when they got home, they were more resilient and they had a better health and quality of life. This is what people reported in these stories that were analysed. This isn't always the case. There were some stories where the opposite was true and a partnership with the healthcare professional was not uh, present. They were not given respect. Their questions and concerns were ignored, dismissed or contradicted and they were excluded from decision making. Um, and Michael's going to talk about compassion later. And um, it's not a word we use often, but I'm sure they would say maybe their care was not compassionate. And as a result, uh, they experienced distress, they lost trust in the professionals. They, they didn't do what they were supposed to do or what was helpful to them, like take their medicines. They, could come, they would come back again uh, and access service inappropriately and, as a result, have poorer health and quality of life. So that's what people say in their reports and their feedback over the last two years to patient opinion. And actually, that's quite good, because we know that only 60% of people through the inpatient survey, CQC inpatient survey, only 60% of patients feel they're sufficiently involved in their care. In fact, 20% uh, report that people talk about them uh, as if they weren't there. And only as a result, only a third to a half of people take their medications, which actually, I think Liz talked about cystic fibrosis. That has a huge impact on outcome and mortality. But we also know that communication could be better because actually a lot of people write in with complaints about it's one of the key themes um, of complaints. And um, Angela Coulter talks about how the expert model of us telling patients what to do can create dependency because people feel they don't have the answers themselves and they have to go back and ask a health professional what to do. It's disempowering. 
So we've got this mismatch between um, a lot of, I mean, I'm sure most health professional would, would say that communication is the most important thing of what we do. And I think that everybody has very good intent around to really listen and be there for the patient. So it's no way are we blaming health professionals, but sometimes the system and working so hard and the phone's going off and you've got the computer on, um, gets in the way of really listening and being there and um, being compassionate and being present for the person sitting in front of you. So we have a, a mismatch between actually maybe our communication style uh, isn't working and the Hello My Name Is campaign is a fabulous, absolutely fabulous campaign I think that illustrates that we can do a lot around basic communication. But we've got this other big problem of behaviour change um, which is what health coaching is about. Um, and why we need conversations that lead into behaviour change is because we've got a massive problem with long-term conditions. So, for example, diabetes alone uh, is costing us about 10 billion and likely to rise to 17 billion by 2040. And the cost of treating uh, diabetes complications is absolutely massive, most of which are preventable. And we also know that actually about a third to a half of people take their diabetes medication um, appropriately. So we've got, we can do a lot more about basic communication, but actually our conversations around behaviour change and supporting people to look after their health and change behaviour, uh, we could do even more. So there's two things going on. So I first got into this as a GP when people were coming back again and again and again, and actually I didn't feel I was making any difference. Um, I had really high patient satisfaction scores in my surgery, so they were happy with seeing, seeing me, but actually we did an audit of people with diabetes and they came back about 12 or 13 times and the HbA1c didn't change. I thought, am I being effective? The second thing as a part-time GP is that there's no way I can know absolutely everything. I just can't know everything, some things I have to look up. Um, or go away and ask people to come back. But actually what I could do was make sure that I really listened and was present for the person and gave them a good experience. And yet I was a GP in Suffolk for 11, 12 years um, and there was only one afternoon that taught communication skills. So I could go on lots of courses about diabetes and prescribing and heart failure, but actually the core skill of communicating with every patient I saw, there was one course in 11 years. So this sort of, this sort of uh, is being overlooked and the impact underestimated. And I wanted to be a really good clinician and I couldn't, didn't know where to go to get the skills I needed to help people change behaviour. So I really like this quote because um, I think it's really important. I believe the 21st century needs a new ambition to develop not talk but conversation, which does change people. So it's not just about listening and exchanging information. I think what Andrew's going to talk about is how health coaching can actually change people and their relationship to their condition. <coughs> so health coaching is helping patients gain the knowledge, skills and confidence to become more active in their um, care, as Sue described. She was more active in how she managed her health and her weight uh, and how she, um, yeah, how she looks after herself. So how to give patients those skills, tools and confidence. And what we've been doing is combining um, clinical skills with behaviour change next techniques within the umbrella of a coaching relationship. And Andrew next is going to be talking about the skills of health coaching. So this is the story, the, the sort of journey that we've bon been on. So in 2010, we were really lucky. We got a regional innovation fund grant, and we, Andrew and I designed the training, and uh, we uh, trialled it out on some practice nurses and evaluated it, and it had improved self-efficacy, which is confident and motivation to look after yourself and patient satisfaction. So we then took three years trying to raise the money. We eventually got some money from the SHA before it disappeared. We trained nearly 800 clinicians and 20 local trainers um, in the east of England. Um, and then last year, I got the NHS Innovation Accelerator Fellowship to roll this out of scale. And in the last year, we've developed resources, which you'll have in your pack. There's a new website launched today, which we'll tell you about at lunchtime, um, which has a lot of information for you to support you doing it locally. And Andrew um, has been rolling out our training to over 3,000 clinicians, many of whom are here from Yorks and Humber, are absolute pioneers uh, in the field. But also, we've got it in policy influence. So health coaching is now one of five priorities in realising the value, which is a initiative to deliver the 
chapter two of the five-year forward view. So we've had a lot of influence this year, supported by the NHS Innovation Accelerator programme, but how big can we go next with your support? So um, we're not quite sure where this is going, but uh, we, we recognise these skills are really, really needed in practice. It's not just been me, as Liz said, it's a team uh, effort, um, lots of training, um, fabulous um, trainers rolling out in their own organisation, are doing amazing pioneering things. We co-created all the material that you'll see, it's not just um, someone um, writing it uh, in an office somewhere, it's actually been developed with um, 20 organisations, over 200 participants, and we're growing this social movement that you are now part of. So I'll just briefly say a little bit why we're passionate about it, as well as uh, our experience and what we're, what we're doing. So there's growing evidence that this has real impact. It activates patients, acts as a bridge between um, clinician and patient. In fact, the studies show that um, half of patients leave their doctor not knowing what they've said, so it acts as a bridge, a communication bridge. It can be used in a wide range of conditions, long-term conditions, falls, cancer, particularly someone who's um, survived after cancer is now a long-term condition, and in mild mental health problems. And it has multiple applications, particularly around medicines management and shared decision-making. But really importantly, it not just activates the patient, it activates the clinician. And we found through training clinicians, it completely changes their mindset from expert, teach and tell, to empower and enable. Um, and clinicians find they can use the skills with their peers in their leadership role. They feel more um, job satisfaction. They feel more resilience. They say, oh, now I can carry on for another 20 years. I don't have to feel a failure if this, my patient doesn't lose weight. We can work together on that. I don't have to feel a failure if this patient isn't taking their medication or they don't do what I tell them. That we can work together on this. So it improves their job satisfaction. And as you will hear in the conversations after me, creates um, champions for self-care. And there's some amazing people here who have been doing incredible work. But the spin-offs is it's not a drug. It is a conversation. And the spin-offs are that patients actually really um, appreciate being engaged, as we heard from the patient opinion stories. And it increases patient satisfaction. And it is, in fact, the beginning of that co-production um, continuum that goes from engaging a patient as a one-to-one -to, -one to engaging patients in our patient participation groups, engaging patients through other groups, and getting patient feedback, for example, through patient opinion. It is the start and the core of engaging patients in their care. But it also, and I'd like to study this, may impact on complaints and errors and what's called failure demand. So I'm sure there'll be a few quality improvement gurus here. But if we don't get it right first time, then people will come back again and again. If we don't listen to what they want and we give them potatoes and they don't even eat potatoes, it's not going to work. So they'll come back. Uh, and I've talked about clinician resilience and burnout. And in the, in the resource guide that you'll see on the website, we have listed all the um, evidence to date, and so to help you make your business cases in your own organisations. So there have been nine attempts to systematically synthesise the data, and there is evidence that health coaching does have an impact on health behaviours. It increases self-efficacy and patient activation, that's their confidence and motivation to self-care. It works best for those most in need, which I think is so important, uh, and helps those people who don't feel in control of their health, who use services disproportionately, um, uh, and who the patient activation measure uh, um, measures in terms of activation. It really does work best for those vulnerable communities and can impact on outcomes. In fact, there's a randomized control trial on diabetes, and the HbA1c went down after coaching, but also was maintained after six months, and also medication adherence, which is, um, will have a massive impact in terms of cost effectiveness, which is what everybody asked me, we do need to do more research. But um, the health navigator here, Karen, is um, working all day, I think, uh, having a conversation uh, with you just now. And I was running two workshops. They've done amazing work. And looking at that top 2% of patients who go in and out of hospital, they've reduced readmissions by 20 to 40%. It's just phenomenal work. Recovery coaching, I think Jane, Jane Packer's here. Jane's done amazing work. Um, on a rehab ward in Hampshire hospitals where they trained up um, 
staff um, on the rehab ward and achieved a three million equivalent of three million saving over a year because people didn't need to go to so many residential home places. Just one physio on our programme looked at what happened before and after she had a programme in terms of her workload. Um, and it was estimated that she'd saved £12,000 a year because she wasn't bringing patients back because she was worried about them. She was bringing them back because they needed to come back. Um, so that's another fantastic result. And as, as I said, adherence and medication-related readmission. So in... Um, in North West London's Hospital Trust, they've trained all their pharmacists in health coaching, and they have different conversations with patients before they leave hospital. And as a result, they have fewer drug-related readmissions. So we know that this, this is working. We need more evidence, but we know that it's working. The other reason is that this is a core policy. So it's, it delivers on Chapter 2 in the Five Year Forward View. It is a requirement in the SDPs and it delivers on the three gaps, the well-being, quality and efficiency gap. So uh, we're passionate about it. We think it's the right thing to do. The evidence um, shows that it's the best thing to do because the NHS won't be sustainable if we keep uh, fueling the fire of demand by having our conversations not working. Um, and a bunch of uh, uh, fabulous organisations have come together to produce the material that's on the website. And we are informally called the Coaching Coalition. We have open arms to other organisations that want to join. And so from today, these are all the materials that you'll be able to access to promote this in your own organisations and systems. Uh, we'd like you to tweet as much as possible. I don't know any tweeters here. Uh, you can go on the website, which is just open today. Um, we've had two launch events, this one and one in Cambridge. There's a short film that we're going to be showing now. There's a booklet in your pack. There's a resource guide full of information. It's, um, it's quite a long read, but you can dip in and out of it on the website. You can choose different chapters to read. We've got off-the-peg training materials. Um, please join our online community and chat with others across the country about this approach. You can use our brand, Better Conversation, um, and please join our coalition. So um, uh, we believe this is the right thing to do, it's the best thing to do, and we want to spread the word and have better quality conversations. I'm just going to leave with two short quotes, uh, one from the... Uh, global expert who we were really um, honoured to meet last week in Boston, Ruth Woolliver. Um, she's absolutely fabulous and she's looked at all the evidence and this is her message to the NHS. I'll just let, let you read it. I'm cramming your necks. <laughs> the slides will be made available. She says, um, providers do not have the right tools to be successful. We do not have the right tools to change behaviour. People do not respond to telling, just telling them. Even education is insufficient. We need these tools to help people help themselves. And she says, by the NHS adopting these tools, we will reap the benefits of a rapidly growing science, showing these processes empower patients to more effectively engage in partnerships to self-manage their lifestyles, promote health and mitigate chronic disease. And I will leave with Sue's quote, which I think is absolutely brilliant before we move on to the film, which is it's conversations and not oper operations that are giving me my life back. And we'll just now play the film, which I hope you'll enjoy. I'm very healthy person. Um, until probably about six or seven years ago, quite suddenly I was diagnosed with MS. We're both healthy and then neurons change, you know, and then he was retiring and it was all suddenly we were home. And if you're ill, then it's a really hard thing because, you know, you're not independent anymore, you're relying on somebody. I was bouncing around the, the NHS system going to see. I was, I was a doctor shopper. I was a therapy shopper, I was looking for a cure. I was uh, in a pretty desperate state really because the pain was uh, managing me rather than me managing the pain. My interactions with my son were more along the lines of, you know, well you've got to do this and if you don't do this you can't have your toys. It would end up in a lot of arguments. You know, it doesn't work for me to just say to him, well, you're going to do your nebulizer, and you're going to do it now, and there's, there's no, you know, I'm not arguing with you. That approach just doesn't work, and it never has worked. It is about collaboration. Oh. 
I know as a GP, and we all know, that patients come back again and again and again, and clinicians sometimes get stuck and don't know how to engage people in their own health. And also, from a patient's perspective, sometimes they don't feel listened to and heard and empowered. So I think for both sides, we need to do something around the conversation. I was lucky to attend a pain management programme, and what people gave me was a confidence and skills to actually self-manage the my pain myself. Health coaching gives patients power and motivation. It gives them a kind of eureka moment. Sometimes it's like a light bulb going off and all of a sudden the pen drops, everything just makes sense. And they come up with this solution on their own and they leave feeling good about themselves, not feeling like they've just been given a set of instructions from yet another professional. It's put me back in the driving seat. Lots of people with long-term conditions, what happens is, is that the healthcare provider actually takes people out of the driver's seat, puts them in the passenger seat, and they just take us around on a little journey around the NHS. I was initially sceptical of health coaching from the beginning for several reasons. Health coaching was new jargon, I didn't understand it, and on the surface, health coaching seemed to be potentially at odds, at friction, with professional identity and our duty of care as doctors. The GP was providing me with lots of the answers about my medication or my treatment, but with the health coach, it really was about me coming up with the solutions to things that I'd identified that were important. And then during that time, she also helped me look for resources that would be available in the community, online, all sorts of different types of resources that might help me get back to walking. It's about an adult to adult conversation, which sounds obvious, but I think we're used to in this medical model of talking down to patients a little bit. We are the professionals and we know it all, and this is about identifying that patients are their experts in their own world. The negotiations about getting it done are much more relaxed, much less stressful, and he's able to talk about how he can manage his condition himself. And he's started to set himself goals which contribute to his well-being. I really feel like there's much more respect between us and I feel we get on so much better because of it. This isn't about a change of mindset only for professionals or only for patients. We all need to change the way we think about health. People really go away and change the way they live from a very simple intervention, perhaps no more than 10 minutes, with one practitioner. We need to change what we do and make hospitals as much a place of health as sickness. One of the things that we've done this year is train up two health coaches to train over 200 staff to help and support those staff have different conversations that will support our patients and deliver better patient experience, better quality and better outcomes. By the time patients arrive, they're already more engaged and more motivated. They're looking to make positive change. Um, and in the long run, that's going to decrease the burden on NHS staff and it's going to empower patients as well. Now with my deepened understanding of health coaching, I see that it is and can make me a better doctor by bringing me back to what I really love about my job and that's people. The process gave me uh, myself back. It really, I started to see myself as a person again. Uh, rather than just somebody who was ill or disabled. And yes, I still have uh, medical problems. I know that there are things that, that won't change and maybe in the future may get, may get worse. Um, but it's given me the confidence to know that I can develop um, skills to get over those or to cope with them in the future.